Hello everyone, welcome to week 5's video. This week we're going to be doing two different things. First we're going to be loading in textures so that we don't have to keep looking at a flat shaded scene. Then we're going to add point lights and we're going to calculate their contribution inside of the fragment shader so that we can have really nice per pixel lighting in our scene. First though, we're going to need to download a few required files from Blackboard. And before you ask me why we're downloading soil and grass, I promise you we're getting somewhere with this. So soil is actually simple OpenGL image library, and it's going to handle our image loading for us because loading in image files is outside the scope of this course, really. And grass, of course, is just a grass texture that we're going to uh, throw on our model just to see that it does come up. So first things first in our assets folder, going to want to create a new folder for textures. Let's get the grass in there. In our include folder, we're going to add soil. And then in our lib folder, of course, we're going to bring in the library for soil. So, of course, we have to link those up now. So let's go into the properties of the project. And in the linker, we just have to make sure that the project knows to also include the soil library. So I'm going to go to all configurations to make sure that I set this up for debug and release. And I'm going to enter in soil underscore ext dot lib. And that'll take care of that. So in order to handle our texture loading, let's create a new class dedicated to the problem. So we're going to want to add a new header file, texture.h. And let's start in there, as usual, before we jump into our source file. So pragma once, we're all used to by now. We are going to need to talk to OpenGL and use some OpenGL features here, of course. So we're going to include glue. And in order to specify the file to load, we're going to need strings. So let's open up the class. And let's see what we can put in here. First, we're going to start with a constructor and a deconstructor. But I'd like to introduce you to another one of my favorite C++ 11 features, which is the ability to explicitly declare constructors as default. So if I had a constructor that, say, I knew was going to be empty and I didn't want to bother um, defining it in the header file and then opening it up in the CPP and making it empty or having something that looks like this, I can actually be a little bit more readable and specify that it's just going to be equal to the default, which is really useful, especially when you have a constructor that does actually take data, but you don't have a default constructor, and uh, C++ starts complaining about it. You don't really want to set that up either. Just throw this one in here, and it'll take care of that as well. So what are we going to need? Of course, we're going to need a bool function that loads. That's going to take a reference to a string object. It's going to take the file. We're going to have a bool unload, which just like in the other, <clears throat> excuse me, in the other classes is going to release OpenGL data. Then we're going to have a bind and unbind, which will work as is expected of OpenGL objects. Then we're going to have the actual, or not really the actual, but the handle to the texture object, which is going to be a GL uh, unsigned int. Whoops. Yeah, no, that's right. Unsigned int. I'm going to call it text object. Going to initialize it to zero. We're all done for the header file. Not too much work to be done there. If we go into adding a new file for our source, we can add another texture. 
First things first, we include the header file. And now we're going to be including that new library. So we're going to go into the soil folder and get soil.h. I'm also going to include input output stream in order to provide some uh, error messages in case things go badly. So let's start with our destructor, or I can go the usual route of copying these over for the sake of being a little faster. Get these all set up with the scoped names. So the destructor, all it's going to do is call unload in order to ensure that the memory on the GPU is released before we lose our last handle to it. Load, of course, is going to utilize the new library in order to load the texture object. Now this is actually really, really easy with this library. So we're going to call a function called soil underscore load underscore OGL for OpenGL and then texture. And now what this returns is actually going to be the OpenGL texture handle. So we're going to save that in there, of course. So inside this function, not only will it load the file, but it'll tell OpenGL everything it needs to know about the file. It'll create the OpenGL object and upload the data for us. So it's a really nice, uh, neat, all-in-one solution really cool simple library that does not overcomplicate things. First parameter is going to be a C string to the actual uh, specifying the actual file. Next we're going to be specifying some flags telling the library how it should behave. We're going to say soil load auto which will not force any particular format on the texture, but rather will upload the texture as it's found and will dictate the actions inside the library based on uh, the width and the height. For instance, one of the options you can pick here is to force a power by two texture or uh, a certain amount of channels, but we don't want to fool with that right now. So next we're going to create a new ID. One of the other features of the library is that you can actually place an existing texture handle in here and it'll overwrite the existing texture, but we want to load a brand new one. And we do want to create MIT maps. So the last parameter will specify that we want it to take care of that for us. And so it's all done. But of course, we should add a little bit of error checking. So I'm going to ensure that our object was not, did not return as zero, which is an invalid texture object. If it did, I'm going to output that it failed to load. But also, while we're here, we can call soil last result, which is essentially just a string that represents the last error that the soil library encountered. So that's going to uh, provide some extra information if the uh, contents of the file maybe weren't in the right format or something, you know, a more fancy error is going on that it'll help you debug. This return, this return here should return false, of course, uh, not just purely return. Now the data is uh, now sent to OpenGL and we would be all uh, done and ready to go. But I would also like to give you a taste of some of these uh, texture functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to modify the texture just a little bit. <clears throat> so we're going to need to uh, to bind it. So we're going to bind texture. We're going to specify that the texture we're binding is a texture 2D. And then of course we provide the handle specifying which texture inside of OpenGL. In order to uh, manipulate 
the actual properties of a texture we're going to be calling GL text parameter I and in the first parameter of the function we specify again that our target texture is a 2d1 next we specify which property we want to interact with let's play around with the magnifying filter and let's make sure that's set to geolinear so if the texture appears on screen in such a way where it's bigger than its real size that is to say that multiple pixels on our screen are each sharing um, a texel of this texture then we want we want the result to be linearly interpolated and smoothed out now if we copy this we can change the target parameter here to the minification filter which tells OpenGL what to do if the texture is really small onto the screen and maybe a 1000 by 1000 texture is trying to be rendered to a let's say 80 by 80 uh, section of the screen what's the behavior of OpenGL in that case well we want it to linearly interpolate between the two closest mipmap levels and also on each of those mipmap levels we want it to linearly interpolate between the nearest pixels or the nearest texels rather so that's what GL linear mipmap linear stands for those settings uh, to be fair would actually have been set up this way inside of the soil library but I just want to give you a taste of what they look like again so text parameter let's open up uh, one more let's have the target this time be texture wrap s now this one let's actually change the default would be clamp to edge meaning that um, if a UV coordinate le uh, goes beyond the range of 0 to 1 uh, and say it was 2 it would be treated as though it was just one but let's say we want to repeat so that if you had a UV coordinate of 1.5 1.5 it would actually just roll over and be interpreted as 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 so we're going to specify GL repeat and we're going to specify this for both the S and T axes now those are just the U and V axes but sometimes they can be referred to as S and T instead, so don't get confused about that. So let's just fill up the other functions we have down here. They're pretty simple. If we have a texture object, that is to say, if our texture object does not equal zero, then we have something on GPU memory we want to remove. And that's simply done through a call to GL delete textures. How many do we want to delete? Just one. And then you give it a pointer to, to the list of handles. But of course, in this case, we're only deleting one. So we could just give it the address of our one texture handle. And then we can set it uh, to zero to make sure it's not accidentally used later. Binding, making the texture the currently active one, simply done by calling GL bind texture as we did up in the load, and calling texture 2D as the target text object is the handle and for unbind we simply pass a null value a zero to specify that no textures are going to be active so uh, pretty concise class but it'll do the trick and soil will take care of loading uh, a few different file types for you the basic ones bitmaps pngs jpegs uh, tgas uh, the common ones that you might be using. So let's go into game.h and we're going to
we're going to add a texture to our scene, to our object. So let's go to the top. We'll include our new texture file. And next to our monkey, let's create a grass texture. Inside of game, of course, when we're in our initialized game, we're going to want to load this one similar to the rest. So if not load, if the loading has failed, Going to load the PNG. Then we can system pause and we can exit. The error message would have been output from inside of this file, so we don't have to do it again here. The reason we did that is because inside we had access to the soil library, so we were able to call soil uh, last error or last string or whatever that one was called. So, uh, of course. Just like we initialized, we need to make sure that in our destructor, this gets unloaded when the game has completed. Oh, as well. Up here, when we enable our states, we're also going to want to enable GL texture 2D. Uh, by default, texturing is actually not enabled by OpenGL so uh, we would not see anything until this is done. And The last step is to make sure the texture is bound before we render our object so luckily we got a class with a function that will do that for us and on the opposite side of the render we want to unbind all the objects we have bound in the opposite order so first with the VAO, then with the grass texture, it just looks like a mirror image of the code above it calling all the opposite functions. So normally at this stage, um, you might expect the texture to work. But in fact, if we run the program, it will not. Oh, and it failed to load the file. Asset, oh, models, I'm silly. Assets, textures, grass. Here we go. So, what did we forget to do? Well, we need to hook up the shaders. The shaders themselves need to be able to interpret the texture, and they need to be told explicitly how to apply it to the object. It's no longer automatic. So what we're going to do is we're going to go and take a look at our shaders. Now our vertex shader needs to do a little bit more now. It does in fact need to pass the UV forward to the fragment shader so that every single pixel can have access to a unique UV coordinate with which to access the texture. So our first job is to specify an out vec2. This is all in the vertex shader. I'm going to call it text coord. We're going to write to that here. Text coord is equal to in UV. No transformations needed. We're simply passing it through. We go into our fragment shader, and we're going to want to have this same line here into the fragment shader, and we're going to change the out into an in qualifier. But this isn't enough to actually get us our texture. What we're going to need is we're going to need to take advantage of another object available to us in the shader called a sampler 2D. I'm going to call it uText. Now a sampler 2D is actually just an integer. What the integer represents is the slot that your texture is bound in. Now it's not the actual texture handle. It, it will represent something else. There are slots in OpenGL that textures can be bound to ranging from about 0 to 32. And by default, you've always been using slot 0. So uText would be set to the value 0. However, when you want to do multi-texturing, you can utilize other slots 
so I could have something like a second texture that I want to read from. And that would actually be slot one. So don't get confused between the texture handles and the slots. You can have texture of handle three bound to slot zero, and then you could have another texture, maybe texture with handle seven bound to slot two. They're different things. But let's take a look at how it's used. What we're going to do is instead of hard coding the color, we're going to call the texture function whose first parameter is the slot that you want to read from. Second parameter being the texture coordinates you want to read at. And so if we run this now, we actually get our texture come up. All the UVs already existed in the model. They were just ignored before. We're able to pass them through. The rasterizer makes sure that the UVs get interpolated across every single triangle face so that every single pixel has a unique set of UV coordinates to read from and can sample the texture accordingly. So now we can see much better an uh, the representation of our object. The ears no longer blend in when they're in front of the rest of the head and between the camera. You can still spot them because of the difference in color. But it still looks kind of flat at the end of the day, right? This is still pretty uninteresting, and not just because we're looking at a monkey with a grass head. So what do we want to do? We want to add lighting. So <clears throat> to start adding lighting, we need to ask ourselves a couple questions. And you do not want to start lighting before you ask yourself these questions. Very, very often, I see people trying to work at uh, lighting and they'll be pulling up the right equations and they'll have the right pieces, but nothing will really work right. And I come to them with the same question and I say, what space are you doing your calculations in? And more often than not, they're not able to give me a straight answer. So the very, very first thing you want to do is you want to decide what space you're going to be doing all of your calculations in. We're going to be playing with a lot of vectors here. There's going to be a lot of dot products, um, and you can't you can't do those and have them be mathematically correct unless those vectors exist in the same space. So we have to be very aware of what's going on. So for the purposes of this um, uh, this lecture, we're going to be using view space in order to represent, uh, or rather, in order to calculate all of our, our our mathematics. So the second question that I was talking about then is what data do we actually need in order to calculate all our lights? And it turns out that it's a lot. So what we're going to do is we're going to specify all the incoming data we require first, then we're going to link it up and compute it afterwards. So let's start at the top. And we'll start adding some new stuff here. I'm going to add a VEC4. The first data of interest is the light's position. Next, we're going to receive the ambient contribution of the light. Now it is a VEC3, but at this point we're interpreting it as color. We're going to have a VEC3 representing the diffuse color of the light. And now you could say that most of the time uh, the light's ambient, diffuse, and specular colors are all the same. But you can get some very interesting effects by adding subtle differences between these. So uh, certainly you'd want to expose them all so that your artist can have full control over, over the scene. Next we're going to have some floats. The first one is going to be the light specular exponent. And that, as we'll see later, is going to determine how tight and vivid the highlights are on your model. Next we're going to have 
three attenuation scalars, which each interact with your light differently in order to make it fall off over the distance. So there's the constant attenuation, which is simply uh, always applied, uh, regardless of how far away the light is. Attenuation that is constant will always bring it down the same level. Linear, well, as you can imagine, linearly bring down the light attenuation as distance increases to a 1-1 one -one ratio. And lastly, we have quadratic, which is the most realistic of the three that makes your light die off quicker and quicker with distance and make the light intensity really explode when it gets uh, really close to the surface. So real lights, of course, are much more complicated than this, but in terms of computer graphics, a mix of these three components actually does a really good job to create uh, pleasant lights. So we still need our one uniform texture. That doesn't change, but we're going to have uh, a couple more things coming in from the vertex shader. Now the vertex shader is going to have to pass us the normal as well. And the reason is in order for lighting to look smooth, we're going to require the normals to be interpolated across a particular face so that we can have a dedicated unique normal per pixel. And that's really the key here. This is per pixel lighting. So everything we're doing, we're doing in the pixel shader in order to get the maximum amount of resolution and clarity. Lastly, we're going to have the position of the actual fragment itself. And that's not to say that it is in screen space, but rather that's the position in view space, the space that we've decided to work in, of the particular surface of the model that we're working at. So this isn't going to be a vertex, but in fact, this can be a position halfway across the triangle. Anywhere inside the triangle where we're shading, we're going to have a position to work with. So let's fill out these two requirements in the vertex shader before we continue. We haven't passed in the normal or the position yet. So in the vertex shader, I'm going to add those two as out variables. And then it just becomes my job to write to them before the shader has finished. So there's two things I'm going to do uh, to my incoming normal. Now, remember the big question and the big answer. We're working in view space, so we need our normal to be in view space as well. Our normal was written uh, to file from Maya or whatever 3D modeling program we had, which means that it's an, it's an ob object space. And just like we transform the vertex out of that space and into world and into view, we have to do the same thing to our normal. There is an issue though here. so. If I do the transformation in the same way as I would with the vertex, this would not compute to what we are expecting, even if you know I make it actually valid and and add the the fourth element here. And the reason is, that these matrices are 4x4 four four matrices. They're homogeneous, which means they don't only represent rotation, they also represent position. Normals, however, are directional vectors. They do not need to account for position. Their position is just relative to whatever space you're working in. The whole point of the normal is that it remains as a unit length vector. If we translate it, however, it's going to skew off in whatever direction it happened to go in, and all our lighting calculations are going to be exploding and they'll be garbage. So somehow, we need to transform the normal into view space while considering only the rotations that have taken place and not also the translations. And it turns out that we can actually do that really easily. GLSL can use its data types with constructors, just like you might 
be used to in C++. So I can actually construct two MAT3 classes here from the MAT4 incoming uniforms. And what these will do is they will uh, isolate the top left 3x3 three three corner of the matrix, which is exactly the part of the matrix that represents just the rotation. So we're able to multiply the normal now by the rotations required to bring it into world space and the rotations required to bring it into view space. And now our normal is good to go. Position, however, we also need to get in view space and to send to the fragment shader. And this is why, by the way, it was really useful for us to split up the model view and projection matrices rather than to just send them in as one because now we can really break up the process and stop the mathematical pipeline wherever we want in order to do our work. So in order to make the position work, we're going to need to uh, stop halfway through. So essentially, we're going to transform the incoming vertex only to view space, and we're going to stop and save that result in pose. Now. This is a little bit different here because I am. Uh, the result of this is actually a, uh, a a four component vector, right? In fact, probably the cleanest way to do this would be to just define another variable. Let's do that instead. So let's define a temporary variable here, view space. And let's set that equal to the result of the incoming vertex multiplied by just the few set, uh, the first two sets of transformations. Then we can take our view space, our view space position. We can multiply it by the final required uh, projection matrix to bring it into the proper space to write to OpenGL. And before we're done. We can make sure that that view space, that intermediate step, gets sent forward in uh, this pipeline of, uh, of the shaders. So of course, uh, there's absolutely no issue writing to this after GL position. GL position doesn't have to be the last thing in here. Uh, in fact, you could do it first if you want, and you could write to it multiple times. Uh, but now, now we're good to go, and we can take a look at really utilizing all of these parameters that we've added to our fragment shader. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to initialize our color to be equal to the ambient. So we're going to take the RGB components of our color and we're just going to set them one to one equal to the ambient. And that's really the simplest uh, effector of light. Ambient is applied indiscriminately of position, of any angles, of distance. It's just going to be applied, so it makes sense to start there before we really get into the meat of everything. And notice that we don't bother writing to the alpha component. The alpha component of our color is going to be determined by the alpha that was in the texture at the very end of uh, this shader. We don't actually want to uh, apply lighting calculations to the alpha. You can start getting into really weird situations where your lights make your models transparent and you can see through them. And most of the time, that's not what you want. However, it would be pretty awesome if somebody has a game with a flashlight that lets you see through walls. That would be that'd be really cool. Nobody's done that yet. That's a challenge for anybody in the class that's interested. So let's uh, let's continue. What's next? Next is to capture our normal coming in from the vertex shader. Now the problem is, if you remember from in class last week, we were looking at the rasterizer and we were looking how, looking at how it actually interpolates uh, per vertex data across an entire shape so that we can have per pixel data instead. And if you imagine that two normals are interpolated using linear interpolation, it's not guaranteed that the result of that is going to be a unit length vector. In fact, uh, it's almost guaranteed not to if the normals are not exactly the same. So what we want to do 
is account for that so that our math doesn't break apart. So we're going to account for the rasterizer interpolating, right? So that means we're going to create a, a normal here. Uh, we can't actually write to this. So if I show you what we were going to do, normalize. We can't write to one of these incoming variables. So we do want to normalize it, but we'll need to create a new temporary normal in order to capture the result of this. And so at this point, we're sure that our normals are working properly. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the uh, direction from the current point in space we're rendering to the light affecting that surface. So that's going to be another vector. I'm going to call that the light vector. That's going to be equal to the light position, which, as uh, you may have considered, is assumed at this point to already be in, uh, in view space. And when we see in the C++ program later, when we upload this variable, we'll make sure that it is, in fact, in view space. So simply by subtracting the two vectors, the source vector on the right, I can get a a direction, right? So I have a vector now from pose to the light's position. So that's not normalized though. And why haven't I normalized it? Well, we're going to need to, for the purposes of calculating attenuation, we're going to need to store the distance between the light and the position. So we're going to have here a uh, float dist, I'll call it distance distance, oh, that's why I didn't, it's a built-in type, distance equals length of light vector. And lastly, we're going to take, uh, we're going to make a new vector, light direction equal to light vec divided by distance, so equal to light vector normalized. So we have now the full vector from the position to the light. We've stored the distance as a float from the position to the light, and we have a normalized direction vector as well. <clears throat> so with all of this, we have all the information we need to determine if this light actually contributes at all to this fragment. And to do that, we need to do a dot product. So I'm going to store the result of the normal dot product against the light vector, or rather, uh, the light direction. So what will this actually represent? Well, if the vectors, if the light vector uh, is outside of 180 degrees of the normal vector, that is to say, if the light vector is approaching the surface from behind the surface, then the result of this will be less than zero. However, if the light vector and the normal vector are exactly the same, so the light uh, is, is pointing directly at the surface. It's perpendicular to the surface and it's giving its maximum intensity possible to that surface. Then the result of the dot product will be equal to one. So we're going to have an if statement here. And we're going to make sure that the additional processing is only done if the dot product is greater than zero. So if the light is not behind the surface. So we can say here that once we're inside, the light can contributes to this surface. So what do we want to do inside? First thing, we can calculate our attenuation, our fall off. That's just going to be a scalar, which is going to 
uh, bring down to some extent the intensity of the light as we calculate it further in this if block. So the attenuation is going to be equal to 1 divided by something. That something is going to get bigger as the light gets further away, meaning that the attenuation factor goes down so that when we multiply it against the color, it also goes down and simulates the fact that, of course, the light didn't uh, brighten the surface as much. So in terms of what this actually is divided by, it's divided by three separate components that all contribute to the size of the attenuation. The first one, which we don't even need brackets for, is our constant attenuation, and it doesn't change. Let's make sure it's felt exactly the same. The next one, the next uh, contributor, is the linear uh, attenuation, which is simply multiplied by distance. And so you can see, as distance get large, gets larger, attenuation grows proportionally. The last one, however, is multiplied by distance squared, and that's why it's quadratic. It is much more intense and grows in intensity very rapidly, so you have to be careful to keep this parameter very small. 0.001 is usually uh, what you'll want to aim for for that, but we'll, we'll see that later. So now that we have the attenuation, we're ready to start computing some of our light. So the simplest uh, to compute, other than ambient, of course, is the diffuse lighting. So let's calculate the diffuse contribution. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, as an additive operation, we're going to take the, the source diffuse color specified by the light. We're going to multiply it by the intensity at which the light hits the surface, which is determined by how perpendicular the vectors were, so the dot product. And then simply multiplied by the attenuation gets you your proper diffuse component. So that part's not too bad. But next we move to the fancier one. We move to specular lighting. And specular lighting not only takes into account the light and its orientation to the surface, but also the viewer. And um, this, certain, this shouldn't be new to you. You should have seen it in class before. and We've done it on the board uh, in the last tutorial. But essentially, only when the reflection of the light hitting the surface and those rays coming out only when those outgoing rays line up with the viewer will the specular component be strong. So you can think about it as literally a projectile emitting from the light, hitting the surface, bouncing off, and your specular is a measurement of how accurate that was in order to hit the camera. So let's calculate the specular contribution now. Oh, sorry, <laughs> missed a step. So in order to do that, it's actually a two-step process, right? Like we saw in class. So discovered by Blin Fong, who wrote a paper on the subject, we're going to calculate the half vector in order to approximate, but very accurately and uh, very uh, with good performance, we're going to approximate the specular component. So um, again, this is a problem that's more easily visualized on the board, and that's why we did it in class. But to jog your memory again, uh, if you imagine uh, the normal coming off of the surface perpendicular, and then on either, either side is uh, the viewer, and on the other side, the light, in such a way that uh, they're both at 45 angles from the surface, so the light coming in bounces off perfectly to hit the eye spot on. Imagine you take the vector from the point of the surface where the light is being hit to the eye. 
and you also take from that same point to the light. You take those two vectors and you, you average them. You average them together to get one. Well, what's going to happen is they're going to converge and the average is actually going to be smack on top of the normal. So you can actually uh, simplify the problem by always taking those two vectors, averaging them, and then actually just comparing how the result of that lines up with the normal itself. And it'll only line up one to one exactly when there's a perfect reflection. And if there isn't, then that contribution starts to fall. So let's take a look at how we compute that using GLSL code. It's actually uh, pretty, pretty long, this line. So we're going to start from the center, and we're going to work our way out. So the first thing we need to do is we need to uh, normalize the negative position. So what that is doing, if you think about it, um, we can write this in this way. right? A zero vector minus position. Exactly the same as just writing negative position, right? But what does it mean when I do this? Well, let me replace then the zero vector with the i position, because this is what's really happening here. We're taking a vector from the position of the surface to the position of the camera and we're normalizing it. We want to know the direction vector from the currently lit surface to to us. Now there's actually a nice optimization we can do here because we know all the time what the i position is. We're in view space so i position is literally 0 0 0. So we can substitute that with a 0 0 0 vector and once we've done that well what's really the point of having, having it? We can just remove that and have negative pose and it'll be the exact same thing. So we take that first and what we do is we add it to light direction. Now the reason we're doing this is because we want to take an average. So imagine you had two values you wanted to take an average from. You would add them together and then you would divide them by two, right? This doesn't really work uh, as well in um, in the situation here with the vectors. Uh, we want to make sure that the result is normalized. This wouldn't necessarily be normalized, just adding them together and dividing by two. So a really clever way to pull this off is to skip the whole division by two part and just normalize the addition, which really actually takes care of the average for you while also ensuring that the result uh, can be used by us mathematically in the rest of our calculations. So now that we have that, we need to compare it to the normal. We need to find out how close to the normal this is to, again, figure out if the bounce would have hit the eye, or rather to what extent it would have hit the eye. So we dot product, and the two parameters, one is our normal, the second being this big thing we just calculated. And one last step. Now, of course, just like over here, we only want to consider values that are greater than zero. If it's, if it's less than zero, then there's no point of having the contribution. We're going to do it a little bit differently this time, though. We're going to call the max function of everything we've calculated and 0.0. .0. The max function, of course, just returning the larger of the two arguments. Meaning that if this entire thing we just did was less than zero, then we don't have to worry about accidentally using negative numbers because it's now smaller than the second argument, and the function will just return that. It'll just return the zero. So this function is guaranteed now, or rather this line is guaranteed now never to return anything below zero. And that calculates our normal dot our hath vector. And just like we had the diffuse contribution, now we can apply the specular contribution. Oh, I already wrote the comment. So out color, 
dot RGB, not considering alpha yet, equals, or uh, plus equals, the light specular color times the scalar we just computed, and just like diffuse, times attenuation. Now, there is one parameter that we haven't used yet. And that is, oh, oh, no, I did right, it's right here. Light specular exponent. Now, this controls, again, the curve or the intensity, you could say the tightness of the specular highlight. And as it is right now, uh, the highlight is actually extremely subtle and very, very wide. If we want to generate a much uh, tighter curve, where the highlight accelerates very quickly when it reaches those high values, then, well, we want to use an exponent in order to generate that curve. So, well, again, we're going to add some additional processing to this scalar we determined before. We're going to put it to the power of the specular exponent. That's a very common practice um, that you'll see in virtually any engine, uh, and artists will expect to have this parameter to be able to play with, and uh, you'll want to make sure that you expose that to them so that they have the freedom to create whatever they need to. So we're almost done here. In fact, the grunt work is done, um, <clears throat> but we need to incorporate the original texture that we had before, which at this point does not appear in the model. So what I'm going to do, and what we're going to do, I'm going to create a, temporarily, a temporary color in order to capture the texture. It's going to be a U text, text cohort just as we had before. Now we're going to do a couple things. Firstly, if you think about what is inside of our out color right now, our out color purely represents the intensity and the color of light. So what we want to do is we want to make that actually textured. And so we multiply. We don't add this time, but we multiply by our texture color dot RGB while our alpha color we fill in without multiplying it's simply written to as texture color dot A now running this at this point uh, will yield strange results Oh, what's this? Vertex shader failed to compile. Line 20, uh, expecting a bracket or something. Line 20. Oh, <laughs> there it is. I had an extra bracket written in. And then 24, vertex shader, view space dot XYZ my mistake on that one we're not concerned about the W component inside of the fragment shader we only need the XYZ and so like I was saying without actually sending any data to the graphics card we're now gonna have a situation where nothing really renders correctly but we can simply fix that problem Let's scroll down into our draw function. What we can do is, for the purposes of the tutorial today, we can hard code all these values just to make sure that they're working. So we can simply call all our um, all our send uniform functions to upload all of this data. Now, of course the name passed through isn't as fitting for the shader anymore considering all the extra processing we're doing but that's unimportant so we're going to have our uh, our light itself uh, right light position what are we going to upload to that we're going to upload a vec 4 
But, like I alluded to back when we were talking in the shader, we need to ensure that we stay consistent with the answer to our question. What space are we working in? We're working in view space. If you don't remember to ask yourself that, I guarantee you will get into a position where one of your vectors is not in the right space, and it'll be extremely difficult to debug because you cannot break point through shaders, at least not without doing a lot of fancy debugging in Ensight. So what we're going to do is actually solve our problem with the tools that we have. We know how to transform vectors into different spaces. We simply use transformation matrices. And we have one, right? We would want to, uh, if this vector, say, was in world space, let's uh, pretend it's 0, 0, 0 for now, or 1 on the end. If we wanted to transform this into view space, we would simply multiply it by the view matrix, right? What is the view matrix? Well, we have it right here. It's the inverse of the camera transform. So we can just substitute that and boom, it's done. This will evaluate to a vector and then get sent off as the light's position. So let's have a more interesting position than 0, 0, 0. Let's have, let's have it 4 on the x so that it'll, it'll appear from the right side of the screen and light the object. Next, we'll start filling in some of the colors. So light ambient, of course, we don't need to transform colors by the inverse camera matrix. These are going to be vector threes, just RGB values. So our light ambient, this one is applied uh, indiscriminately of angles and distance, remember. So you want this one to be the smallest because it'll never get scaled down. So we can have something like 0 0.15 across. If you have a nighttime scene, you can make it a little bit more blue. Daytime scene, bring out the orange, right? Uh, of course, uh, all of these can change per frame. So depending on the time of day, you can have, instead of this in here, you can actually call a LERP function between two different colors, third parameter being a 0 to 1 uh, from nighttime to daytime, right? Really easy once you expose all of these to play around with them, create some really interesting effects. So, our diffuse, let's uh, let's go for a lot of red. Let's bring that one up with red. We'll have uh, we'll, we'll make it a little bit more even, even across. Bring that up a little bit. Why not? But more or less, the light's going to end up being red. Specular. Specular is applied the least liberally of uh, the three components, so you'll usually want it, uh, the values inside of that color to be the highest because they won't really come out so much. But let's just make that like a really intense red, maybe with a, a little bit of normalization across the other components. And as far as its uh, specular exponent goes, being a float, we don't need the vector anymore. Let's get that to a 50. So that's going to end up being a, a pretty defined point at 50. But of course, now that all of these are here, you can play around with them after the video is done. So we're going to want attenuation constant. linear and quadratic. Now, you certainly don't want 50s for these. Uh, the values you should expect to put into these are more like 1 for constant, um, 0 0.1 for linear, and a really small value for quadratic. So only one more thing which we need to do, which is actually to set up the, um, where is it, the UTEX sampler 2D. And of course, remember, we're setting that to the slot that we want to use, which by default is zero. We're only binding one texture at a time. So we can, uh, we can set that here. Fill in the gap, why not? 
pass through dot send uniform u text simply the value zero and that'll take care of that now that the grass texture is being bound it'll be applied to it so if we run this now you should see a much much more interesting scene that looks great that looks much better than what we've had before you can really get a sense for where the polygons are on the object now or at least the shape of the object because of the lighting and the interpolation of normals across surfaces um, you can't really get a sense of individual polygons you can still see around the silhouette that it is hard edged but uh, the surface itself uh, fools your eye into thinking that it's smooth because of the lighting uh, you can see uh, the highlight moving across the model uh, especially as the back of the head comes around that specular highlight there uh, the ambient is making sure that the left side of the model is still lit even though uh, light is on the right side. So we can play around with some of these values, right? We can take the specular exponent, we can bring it up even higher to something like 100 and we can bring up its red component to 1.0 really bring it out. Now it feels a lot more plasticky. We can bring down the ambient components can bring them all the way down to zero and now any part where the surface of the triangle does not have some direct contribution from the light source we'll see complete black it's a really cool effect kind of eerie actually I'm gonna turn that off so you can play around with these yourself of course have some fun. Make sure your artists learn about all of these parameters if they don't know them already when you uh, integrate them into your own game. Shader uh, code is free for you to use, of course. So I hope uh, you've learned something and I hope to see that you add all of these uh, cool new features into your own games. Let's take a look at the files that we've written today and then uh, we can call it. Texture header file texture source game.h, two simple changes at the top including texture at the bottom creating the new grass texture game.cpp itself at the top unloading don't forget to enable Texture 2D. No other changes down here. And of course the shaders themselves. See you next time.